What's up, 412? Come on. Thank you, Heather, Savannah. You guys are incredible. Yo, we have some incredible people here at 412, and I just I have the honor of leading. If you love your small group leader, will you point at them? Will you cheer for them? Will you clap for them? Will you love your small group leader? Uh, my name is Jimmy. Uh, I'm not your small group leader. I get to be your pastor, and I'm so excited about Every week, I stand in the back, and I look out, and I'm just, I even saw Carly a second ago. I said, what is this? This is our youth group. This is what we get to do. Y'all, do not take for granted we are in the middle of a move of God. Amen? This is a youth ministry of 400-plus teenagers. We're building a 1,000-seat auditorium across the, across the property, and we're going to be having youth group in there once a month. And, and the idea of, oh, did I just let something slip? Oops. Uh, but we are doing youth ministry. We get to go into the big building. And y'all, God, this is a move of God. But here's the reality. You could be a part of this and you can miss it. Because there's a thing in Scripture that says there are people who hear it, but they don't actually put it into practice and they deceive themselves. And tonight, I want you to not just hear this good news. I want you to put it into practice. And I promise you, if you put it into practice, God will change your life. I promise you, it's changed my life. I'm excited about it. We're talking about the Bible. This is week two. Last week, we talked about uh, the story of the Bible. Because what I want you to know is that uh, many people know the stories in the Bible. You know Joah, Jonah, you know Noah, you know Moses, you might know Jesus, you might have heard of Peter and Paul. But you don't know the story of the Bible. How did we even get this thing? How is it even a book that we are reading today? Is it sacred or is it just some, 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 some good thoughts? Is it actual scripture or is it just one of many good books that are all around? And week one, we talked about that. And here's the one thing I want you to know. More than ever in human history, we have access to the Bible now more than ever in human history. The access we have is ridiculous. We have the Bible on our phones. We have the Bible on the internet. We have the Bible in a bunch of different forms, uh, Bible and all sorts of stuff. All that being said, last week we highlighted a couple funny versions of the Bible. Well, listen, we have such access to the Bible that people are sitting in creative meetings being like, how can we put the Bible in a different way? This is what I found. I promise you, Google funny Bibles, you'll find this stuff. This is what I call the Yee Yee Bible. Yee Yee. It's camouflage. Now, I want to believe that this is for like the secret church and when they're coming to steal your Bibles, you can just throw it in the leaves and they'll never find it, right? Uh, yeah, it's the, I, I, this is actually called the Outdoor Sportsman Edition of the Bible. Get this. This Bible is for you and your, all of your adventures. It's waterproof in case you drop it while you're kayaking down a river. It's in case you're jumping off of a waterfall with your Bible in your pocket, it's waterproof. It's completely waterproof. Uh, it is, get this, it's fireproof in case you're reading next to the fire, staying full, warm, and, you're, and you drop it. Or in case someone comes and tries to burn your Bible, you're like, ha ha, it's not burnable. <laughs> Can't burn this Bible, it's the yee yee Bible. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, who, who thought of this? You know, there's little details about this. I'll post this on the social media, but there's like a cross and twigs right here. And I'm like, oh, that's cute. And then I looked even detail. I mean, it's super detailed. This is camouflage on the, on the, on the, on the cover. You want to know what the name of this camouflage is? It's a true story. It's right here. This is God's country camouflage. That's what this is called. <laughs> God's country camouflage. It's literally, it's copyrighted, so you're not allowed to use this camouflage unless it's from God's country, right? Anyway, but that, that's just one of the, the many Bibles that, that I found. Last week, I talked about the Hug a Bible, just because uh, my, I, have pastor's ki I have kids and they're pastor's kids. Y'all check out Maggie, and this is her introduction to the Hug a Bible. So I was like, Maggie, there you go. This is my little one-year-old, and I want her to hold God's word close to her heart. So it just soaks into her through osmosis. I don't know how that Bible works, but there's so many weird Bibles out there today. Here's what I'm trying to say is that for thousands of years, Christians literally died to get the Bible in our hands. And the Bible is so common today, it's getting dusty in our houses. And I wanna, I wanna, I wanna spark a flame within you to understand what is the Bible, to understand. Because when you understand the story of the Bible, it'll help you appreciate the Bible. 
You start to see it as more than just a book. You start to see it as sacred, as supernatural, as God's word. You know, if you start to understand the story of the Bible, it won't be so easy for you to discount stories in the Bible because there are a lot of weird stories in the Bible. I'm not up here trying, I'm not ashamed of anything in this thing, but there are some genuinely weird stuff in this Bible. But when you know the story of the Bible, you know where we got the Bible, you know where the Bible comes from, you, it won't be as easy for you to discount because we live in 2019. Not only do we have the greatest access to the Bible that we've had in human history, we have greatest access or we have the great ability in this moment to find people who might try to attack the Bible. They say, did you know your Bible says this? And if you're going to believe this, do you know the Bible says this? And you're a few Google clicks away from finding out something in the Bible that might raise skepticism in your heart to be like, I mean, I know Jimmy says it's true and I know 412 thinks it's true, but I I'm starting to have a, a skeptical heart towards the scriptures. And I want to tell you today that I don't want you to be ashamed of that. I want you to run to God with that and wrestle with it rather than running away from it. Because I don't want the skepticism to be surface level now and then you go to university or you go to college or you go into the workforce and then you abandon the faith because you never took the time to learn the story of the Bible. And when you learn the story of the Bible, you will fall in love with God's word, the Bible. That's what the, this whole thing is about. Because here's the reality, the way that, we got our Bibles, meaning me and you. You got handed a Bible like this. It starts in Genesis, goes to Revelation, right? This is the way you got your Bible, was like something similar to this in a genuine imitation leather Bible with your name probably putting on it. I don't know, but you got the Bible this way. That's not the way the world got the Bible. You're like, wait, what does that mean? In 2019, you were handed a Bible, Genesis, to Genesis the whole way through Revelation. But the way that we got the Bible, the world, the way the Bible came into existence was through an event called the resurrection. And because of a resurrection, they had these eyewitnesses that started to see that a dead man had come back to life. And they started writing about it. They started seeing that a dead man had come back to life and they started writing about it. And they, we have these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, eyewitness accounts. And that's what we talked about last week. Check the YouTube channel for that if you want to see all the details behind that. Last week, we started, about, we started looking at those eyewitness accounts of the, of the New Testament. And tonight, week two, I want, you to talk, I want to talk about discovering the Old Testament. That's what tonight is going to be all about. How did we discover the Old Testament? Well, it starts back with the resurrection. Because the only reason we have the Old Testament is because of the resurrection. Let me kind of unpack that for you tonight. Luke chapter 1. Remember how this whole thing starts? Luke is a first century historian, a real man who really lived. He has a friend named Theophilus. He writes a book called Luke. He doesn't know it's going to be the Bible, but he's being faithful with what he's believing God's calling him to do. So he writes an orderly account of the things that had happened amongst them. Luke 1.1 1, 1 literally says it this way. This is the way he starts his book. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, this is those who are from the beginning. The beginning of what? Genesis? No, the beginning of Jesus were eyewitnesses and ministers to the word they have delivered to us. Two big words in this that I want to highlight is many and eyewitnesses. There are many eyewitnesses. Luke isn't the only account. We have Matthew and Mark and John. We have Paul. We have James. We have many different eyewitness accounts of what has happened. This isn't made up. This is history. I could go through all of the different authors. I could go through all of the different ways that these guys had abandoned their faith. Did you know that, you know, uh, Luke is a first century historian. He wasn't a disciple himself, but the other three gospels were written by or dictated to by the disciples. You have Peter who dictated to a guy by the name of John Mark. That's why you call the book Mark, but it's really written by Peter or dictated while John Mark wrote it. But you have Matthew, disciple. You have Mark, which is really Peter, so disciple. You have John, disciple. Do you realize they all abandoned Jesus at the cross? They all ran away from him. But because there was a resurrection, they became disciples again. Because once they saw that he resurrected, then they came back. And then this movement began to start because there was an event that sparked a movement that gave us the Bible. And then even Luke, like Luke is one of these guys who had friends who was talking about it. And he's an eyewitness. Then you have this guy named Paul. Paul hated Jesus so much that he murdered Christians. And then when the resurrected Jesus showed up and revealed himself to Paul, he went from the resurrection of Jesus, went, had Paul go from being a murderer to a missionary. 
Then you have James, the brother of Jesus. He literally thinks that Jesus is crazy. How many of you would think your brother or sister is crazy if they claim to be God, if they claim they could die and come back to life? Yeah, you'd think he's crazy. But because of the resurrection of Jesus, James went from thinking Jesus was crazy to being a leader in the church and writing a book called the book of James. What I want you to hear louder than anything else here tonight is that the resurrection takes dead things and brings them to life. The movement of Jesus was dead at the cross, and it sprang to life in the resurrection, and it launched a movement that gave us the Bible. The resurrection of Jesus reminds us that dead things come to life. If you're here tonight and you've given up, I want you to know that the resurrection can bring you back to life today, spiritually. That's what this is all about. And so, all that to being said, that's the beginning of how this whole thing started, right? They were eyewitnesses. Jesus had actually come back. This isn't made up, something that they read. Eyewitness accounts of what Jesus had really come back to life. And it's fascinating as you get in there and read this stuff. Well, in Luke, he starts in Luke 1. Well, let's read the end of Luke because there's, if you're going to discover the Old Testament, because remember, I said the Bible is a holy book. It's a separate book. It's a book different than any other books. The actual book I believe the beginning of this Bible is, a, is in the second half of the book, which is weird to some people. All I'm trying to say is it started with these eyewitness gospel accounts. So Luke is like, I'm going to write the things that had happened. He gets to chapter 24. It's the end. He's kind of bringing the whole story, the narrative of Jesus to a close. Well, it ends with the resurrection. He tells three stories of after Jesus had died publicly. He kind of addresses that in chapter 23. And in chapter 24, he starts addressing three different times that Jesus, the man who really died, who really came back to life, he reveals himself to three different groups of people. And he does that three different times. Side note on that, all three groups of people didn't believe that it happened because it was the craziest thing you could ever imagine that a dead person would actually come back to life. It's fascinating. We're going to highlight Luke 24, 36. It's actually the third of the three resurrection appearances that Luke records. It says, as they were talking about these things. So this is the disciples. They have been told that Jesus has resurrected. And get this, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. It's too wild for them to understand because they watched him die. They watched him get torn, torn down off a cross and put into a tomb, publicly humiliated. So they still didn't believe. And as they were talking about these things, could it be true? Jesus himself stood among them, right? And he said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. Now, you talk about the whole spooky challenge we're doing right now, the whole like jump scare challenge we're doing right now. If your parents get upset with you that you scare them and try to record it, tag at 412fam on it because we want to share some of those next week. You can just say, hey, 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 it started with Jesus. Read Luke 24, okay? Because Jesus just shows up and they're all like, ah! And it says they literally thought that he was a spirit. They thought that he was a ghost. So don't let anyone tell you different. Halloween started with Jesus in Luke 24, okay? No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. That part's not true. But what I am saying is that our jump scare cat challenge, now don't take it weird. We're not doing anything demonic. I don't want to see any witch faces or, or ghouls or demogorgons. But like monkey faces, side note, y'all saw the monkey face earlier? Do you know who that was? That was Pastor Reg. <laughs> Scaring JR. That's so funny. Anyway, we're doing the spook challenge. Scare the crap out of your families. Ah, scare your families a lot. And... Uh, and tell them it's Luke 24, just read it. And then they'll be like, oh, we're reading about the resurrection. All is forgiven. That's probably not going to happen either. But uh, anyway, so Jesus gets in on the jump, st jump scare challenge. He kind of scares them all. And they're like, ah, because they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do, you, why do doubts arise in your hearts? You see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and, and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And, and when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, you got anything to eat? I'm hungry. <laughs> That's what he says. You have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. Here's the interesting thing about the disciples' disbelief and how it can change your life tonight. I think we have grown up in a society where we've heard about the resurrection of Jesus so much that we've lost the power of the resurrection in our lives. You've heard about it as a common thing, that Jesus has just resurrected from the dead. 
And you've heard about it so commonly growing up, and you kind of just associate, okay, that happens. And because you're living on this side of history, we, we get into this place where, like, oh, yeah, I know Jesus resurrected from the dead. But until you experience your own resurrection through the power of Jesus, you'll never really get what it means for a dead man to actually be resurrected. It is such a wild thing that a dead man would die on a cross and come back to life three days later that his very disciples that walked with him for three, day, three years wouldn't even believe that he was back to life. The women were at the tomb and they see angels and, and all of the, like, the guards are passed out on the ground and they run and they tell the disciples and Peter literally takes off for the tomb and he literally looks into the tomb. This is all recorded in Luke 24. He sees that the tomb is empty. He is a disciple. He heard Jesus say he was coming back to life and it says he thought to himself, this is like an idle tale. I can't believe this. And then Jesus shows up to these two guys, Cleopas and one of his friends. They're on a road to Emmaus. I don't know where that is. All I know is they're walking away from Jerusalem. They're leaving the events of the crucifixion. Why? Because the movement of Jesus is dead in the, res in the crucifixion. And Jesus starts to talk to them. and like, have you not heard of the things that have happened? Like, and they're like, yeah, we saw this guy, Jesus, and we thought that he was going to redeem us, but he died and it's over. We're headed home to Emmaus. And Jesus reveals himself. And you know what they do? They turn around and they run back to Jerusalem. They tell the disciples, this man, he's alive. We saw him with our own eyes. And then in verse 24, it picks back up and says, as they were talking about these things, they still disbelieved. All I'm trying to help you understand is that a little bit of disbelief that Jesus resurrected from the grave will help you get to a place to believe that he actually resurrected from the grave. Grave, ugh, can't talk, lots of words. But all I'm trying to say is, you've grown up with this and you've heard this a thousand times. And I don't want you to lose the power of the resurrection in your own life. I don't want you to lose. Listen, people die, and it's terrible. And it was terrible for all the disciples. And guess what happens after people die? I don't know if you've experienced it. I have. People stay dead. They're, they're not coming back. It's been happening for thousands of years of recorded human history. It's been happening all over the earth today. It's a reality that some of you are grappling with right now. Right now, there's a small group leader not with us right now because they're at a funeral. The reality is, is people die. The reality after that is people stay dead. But there was a moment 2,000 years ago where a man who claimed to be God proved it by coming back to life. Can you believe that he has the power over death, hell, and the grave? I believe you need a little bit of disbelief before you get to the place of true relief. Wait, wait, wait. You're telling me that a dead man came back to life. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. And I love that Jesus in scriptures, I tell you this all the time, God has gone to great lengths to make himself known. It started with Jesus. And it continued to the scriptures, the word of God. I believe that this book is perfect. I believe that it's unchanging. You can't change it. It changes you. It's perfect. And it's timeless. It'll last forever. God has gone to great lengths. The question is, is are you allowing the same Bible that people died to get in your hands to get dusty in your life? Dusty on your bookshelves. I want you to understand the power of this Bible. Jesus goes to great lengths in this moment. He's like, look, I'm flesh and bones. I'm not a ghost. I want to eat. I'm not a ghost. I'm a real person. I really came back to life. This isn't like some other thing. No, I'm proving that I'm God. I came back to life. And then you're like, then in verse 44, let's continue. So then he says to them, after he's munching on his long john silvers, after he's eating his broiled fish, right? He says to them, these words, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Uh, we get that. You, for three years, he talked about this. They're finally to a place to where they're believing it. And then he says this incredible statement. He says that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now, important moment in this moment. The New Testament has not been written yet. This is the moment of the resurrection. They're just now starting to believe. So they hadn't yet gotten to the place to where they wrote their own gospels. And so Jesus says he opens their mind concerning the scripture. So what is Jesus referencing? He's referencing the Old Testament portion of your Bible. And he's calling them scripture. He's calling them God's word. He's calling them the scriptures, the Old Testament portion of your Bible. He's equating them to being God's word. And he says it in an interesting way. 
opens their mind. He says, thus is it written that, the, that Christ, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in the name all nations, beginning in Jerusalem and ending up in Beaumont, Texas. You are witnesses of these things. Today, we are witnesses of these things. What's amazing about this is he's saying, there is an event that has happened. There is an event that has happened in the resurrection, but that doesn't mean that God has just started working. He's been working for thousands of years, as evidenced in this Old Testament through a concept called prophecy. Now, prophecy is, I, mean, I don't know if you know what prophecy is. You've grown up in church, you're like, well, it's prophecy. That sounds like a big, scary word. Prophecy in this sense is talking about how God would give a word to a, a prophet and they would speak about the future. That's how God would validate that it was God's word, that he would say something about the future because God exists outside of time. We live in time. God actually created time. And so we're creatures looking at what things are created. And so I try to understand, but God lives outside of time. We live inside of time. So God could talk about things in the future and all this sort of stuff. With me? All the prophecy is is God predicting the future through a man, and it gets validated by that actually coming true. Now, it would be, be anything. It would be like, I could prophesy that Alabama is going to beat A&M on Saturday, right? And I'm going to the game, right? Heather and I are going. Now, many of you would be like, Jimmy, don't say that. But how many of you know that that's probably going to be true, right? None of you, but here's the reality. I, take your fandom aside. Alabama's the best team to ever play college football. Take your fandom aside. I'm just saying. If it ends up coming true, none of you are going to say, Jimmy, you're a prophet. They're just going to say, Jimmy, you're smart. But if I were to predict the end of the world next week, Many of you would be like, oh. but if it actually happened, you would say, wow, that must be like God. How I many remember in like 2012, the world was supposed to end, right? They prophesied the world was going to end. How do we know that their prophecies were false? Because I'm alive. Ha <laughs> ha. You're stupid. I'm sorry. That's true. But that's how God would work. He would say, hey, this is going to happen. And when it does happen, you're like, whoa, that's true. Jesus opened their mind. Now, here's the, the same thing. I need you to understand the concept of the Old Testament. Jesus opened their mind concerning the scriptures, and then Jesus goes to great lengths to help you understand what are these scriptures. And he says, the law, prophets, and psalms. This is what he's saying. He gives three breakdowns for scripture, three groupings of scripture. And he's like, what are you talking about? Jesus is referencing what I call the Hebrew Bible. How many of you are Jewish? I'm not Jewish. So this technically Bible has nothing to do with me as a white male, because I'm not Jewish. I'm not Hebrew. So technically, this thing has nothing to do with me if I was only basing it on my ethnicity. It'd be like the United States of America. You have, we all know our history. This was their history. This was their, how their God worked with them. And it's called the Hebrew Bible. They had it lumped into, you know, can I just go nerd mode for a second? Let me just nerd mode. Stay with me five minutes, and then I'll get back to the good stuff. Uh, this is good stuff, but we'll get back to it. But nerd mode for five minutes. 1,400 years before Jesus, there was a group of Hebrew people that were enslaved for 400 years. And they began to exodus out of slavery because God had worked on their behalf. At this point, it was the Hebrew God. Uh, there was tons of gods that were talked about in ancient times. This is particularly the Hebrew God. The Hebrew God, you know, worked on their behalf, and these 10 plagues happen. They, they leave, and it's called the Exodus. And it's during that, year, that time period, 1,400 years before Jesus, that the first five books of the Hebrew Bible were written by a guy by the name of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's called the Law. It's the 1,400 years before Jesus. Fast forward 1,000 years, 400 years before Jesus, the last book of the Hebrew Bible was being written. It's called the book of Chronicles. It's the last book of the Hebrew Bible. It's actually a summary of the entire Hebrew Bible is what Chronicles is. All the events and all the history that happened, it starts, the first word of Chronicles is Adam, and it gets the whole way to this last prophet by the name of Zechariah. And this is the Hebrew Bible over all of a thousand years Generation after generation, a bunch of different authors, a bunch of different uh, generations, and a bunch of different cultures all through this Hebrew nation who is going around and traveling around, being enslaved, not being enslaved, being overruled and overruled. And it's a fascinating history of this nation. What's interesting is that Jesus actually refers to this in Luke 11.51. If you want a Bible nerd out with me, just jot down Luke 11.51. Jesus literally says, when he's talking to the, to the religious people, he says, yeah, well, from the prophets... Starting with Adam, the whole way through Zechariah, 
So there he is again calling the Old Testament scripture, or from the first to the last prophet, from Genesis to Chronicles. And you'd be like, uh, Jimmy, I know my Bible. The last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. Well, that's because we got into it in the, in a couple hundred years after Jesus. We started, just, I'm going to get to that in a second. But again, it's a thousand years, different authors, three main categories. They group them into the law, prophets, and the writings. And Jesus references all three of them. The actual Hebrew Bible only has 24 books. Our Old Testament has 39. You might be like, what's going on? Well, again, it's their Hebrew Bible. And in their Hebrew Bible, they have a book called the 12, which is these minor prophets. In our Old Testament, we actually break them out into a bunch of different books. And thereby we get more. We get 39. They have 24. Plus Chronicles, we have 1st and 2nd. Samuel, we have 1st and 2nd. They just have Samuel. They just have Chronicles. So they have 24 books in their Hebrew Bible. And we have 39 books in our Old Testament. You'd be like, Jimmy, why do you keep saying their Hebrew Bible? And Jimmy, why do you keep saying our Old Testament? Here's what I want you to know. The Old Testament is evidence that God has been working all along. The Old Testament is evidence that the event isn't just something that happened, it's something that has been happening. The moment of, we got our Bible because Jesus resurrected from the dead. And when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he then pointed back to how God was not just working right now. He had been working for 1,400 years more through because the entire Old Testament points to Jesus. He said they opened their minds according to the, to the law, prophets, and psalms, mentioning all three of the different types of groupings of, the, of their Hebrew Bible and saying all along from Adam, there's a very beginning in Adam. There's prophecies calling for a Messiah that come true in Jesus for over a thousand years. It's evidence of who our God is. You may look at 412 today. There's 400 of us here today. You may say, wow, this is an event that happened. But I can tell you, I know the last six years, God has been happening up until this point. The resurrection is where uh, is, it's the definitive point of history where a, a, cre a miracle happened, but God was at work for thousands of years. You may be in a moment where you don't know what's happening in your life. I want to tell you the good news of who our God is, is that God is working in your life right now. You may see the fruit of someone else and say, God, I want that. I want that miracle. I want that life change. I want that coin to drop. I want that moment. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to do that. You may say, I want that. But God is still working on your behalf, even though it hasn't happened. Know that it is happening. You're here tonight. You may, you may not even want to be here tonight. God's working on your behalf. It's happening. You may have just grown up in a Christian home, and you, you've come here out of obligation because it feels good. And a moment for you hasn't happened yet. Listen, it's happening. God is working on your behalf. I've seen it happen over and over again. And the Old Testament is a picture of God is working. It's the full context of the story. The Old Testament, can I just be honest with you? And people are like, Jimmy, your pastor, you probably shouldn't say this. I'm okay with saying this. The Old Testament is weird. It's incredibly weird. There's a whole book of Leviticus that scares me, right? It's like, it's a weird book. Like it just genuinely, it's weird. It's for a people. It's for a nation. I'm not Jewish. Why do I even, why do I even read this thing? Because I'm like, I'm like an, an English American, right? I, I do not have any tint to my skin. I'm translucent. Why, why do I read this book? And I'm not telling you to abandon the Old Testament. I'm not telling you that. Because I don't think we should abandon the Old Testament. I think we should anchor it. I don't think we should abandon the Old Testament. I think we should anchor it. You know, Jimmy, what does that mean? What does it mean to not abandon the Old Testament? Here's what I mean. There could be an opportunity for someone to pull something out of the Old Testament. And if you don't know where we got the Old Testament, you could throw out the story of Jesus. You could throw out everything about your faith because someone showed you some weird random verse in the Old Testament and it could cause you to walk away from your faith completely. But I'm not saying we should abandon the Old Testament. I'm saying we should anchor it. Where should we anchor it? You want to know the anchor point of the Old Testament? Here's your anchor point for the Old Testament. Because of Jesus, I believe that the Hebrew Bible is actually our scriptures. Because of Jesus, I believe that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is scripture. Here's what I mean to that. Here's what I mean by that. This is our anchor point. Because Jesus, I believe in an event called the resurrection that really happened through the eyewitnesses of the New Testament. And because I believe in an event called the resurrection that Jesus proved that he was God, 
And then Jesus, who is God and is now the authority, if he believes that the Old Testament is Scripture, guess what I believe? The Old Testament is Scripture. If he says the law, prophets, and Moses, and Psalms, if he believes that the Old Testament is Scripture, guess what I believe? That the Old Testament is Scripture. And you may be like, Jimmy, why is this even a point? Why is this even a strategy? Because I don't want you to get to university. I don't want you to get to a friend who calls himself an atheist or someone who's agnostic. I don't want you to get there, and I don't want someone to bring something out of the Old Testament that is genuinely weird because it's for a people that isn't our nationality thousands of years ago. But I don't want them to pull that out and for you to have your whole faith crumble because you can't explain the Old Testament. I'm not asking you to abandon it. I'm asking you to anchor it in Jesus. Here's your job. Point them to Jesus because when you point them to Jesus and the resurrection, dead things come to life. And when you point them to Jesus, guess where Jesus is going to point them? Back to the Old Testament. He's going to say for thousands of years, God has been working. God has not abandoned us. God has been working. Here's what I mean by that. Y'all ready for this? This is, this is amazing what's about to happen. If you, if you haven't been listening to this point, listen to this right here. Prophecies in the Old Testament. There's this book called Evidence of the Man's Verdict by Josh McDowell. Uh, this is where I get all this information. Prophecies in the Old Testament. Did you know that there are 60 major prophecies identifying what's called a Messiah, what's called a trying to prophesy about the future and the truth of one man being the Son of God coming from earth, coming from heaven, going down to earth? There's 60 major prophecies. In the Old Testament, over 1,000 years, there are 270 minor prophecies that kind of mention, or they're kind of, you know, they're minor prophecies. You have major prophecies. You have minor prophecies. There are 60 major prophecies over 1,000 years by different authors, God working. God is always working. And there are 270 what we call ramifications, which are minor prophecies. So using, listen to this, using the science of probability, and that's a big word. You never thought you'd hear that in church. Using the science of probability, the odds of all of these prophecies over these thousand years, the 60 major, the 270 minor prophecies, the odds of just 48 of them coming true in one man is this number that I don't understand. It's one in 10 to the 157th, meaning 157 zeros should follow that number 10. That's the odds of all of those prophecies coming true in one man. And so when Jesus opened up their minds concerning the Old Testament, we shouldn't abandon it. We should anchor our faith in Jesus. And he will point us back to the Old Testament and say, God has been working all along. There have been hundreds of prophecies. And he opened their minds concerning how they all came true in Jesus. This stuff is incredible. It's wild as you begin to get into this. And these aren't just like some of you may say, well, Jesus knew the prophecies. So he had like a to-do list, Right? And he just kind of marked them off as he went. Here's where this gets really, really, really good. What if just eight of them came true? What if eight of the hardest prophecies came true in Jesus? What do you mean by a hard prophecy? Here's what I mean. Here's a prophecy that says he would be born in Bethlehem. Do any of you have control over where you got born? No. I was, I was born and I didn't have control of that. It says that he was born into the family of David. So if any of you had control over what family you were born into, that, that one was a little bit louder. No. <laughs> I love my family, so I'm glad, right? It says he was, listen to this. He lived when the temple was in Jerusalem. So the temple had to be a, a, a structure in Jerusalem. Did you know that in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed and it hasn't been back up since? So he had to live in a certain time period and the temple was actually up when he was living in Jesus. It actually prophesied the way he would die. How many of you, uh, you know, uh, sorry, he prophesied the way he would die. And actually what's beautiful about this is that it was prophesied the way he would die 800 years or about 700 years before the invention of a crucifixion had even been invented. So talk about not only the way he would die, the way he would die was not even invented yet. But even more than that, the way he would die was prophesied. Now listen to this, if you took eight of those prophecies. Let me show you, because if you're like me, I'm a visual thinker. I need, a, I need a helper on stage. Alan, come on, buddy. Alan's a greeter for us. He's a great man. Uh, come on, bring up Alan on stage today. Now, Alan, I'm going to, Alan, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to win a hundred dollars. Are you cool with that? A hundred bucks. So here's a hundred dollars and quarters. 
$100 and quarters in here, right? Feel that weight? Feel how heavy it is? Is $100 and quarters in there? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's heavy. You can, win, you can have all of this. I'm going to take one quarter. And this afternoon, Carly uh, and the team, we painted it red. I'm going to drop it in there. I'm going to mix it up. All right, I'm going to shake it up. If you could put your hand in there, if you could put your hand in there and grab that one red quarter, I'll give you all hundred dollars. Okay? Put your head in the air because you got to be, you can't look. I don't have a blindfold. Head straight in the air. Put your hand in there. Dig around. Five, four, three, two, one. Pull it out. You got the red one. It's yours. Nah, it didn't happen. You could keep that quarter. Thank you very much. I, I, I just, I'm a visual learner. So that was a one in 400 chance that he would win this hundred dollars, right? And that was just this amount of quarters right here. In this science of prophetic probability, that big number one in 10 to the 157th power, hard for us to understand. Here's what that means. How about just eight of those prophecies? Throw that on the screen. Just eight, those hard ones that I talked about that you have no control over. That would be one in 10 to the 17th. This is the probability of this coming true in one man. These eight prophecies that happened. The Old Testament was written over a period of a thousand years. There's 400 years between the last book of the Old Testament and Jesus's life. The odds of these coming true in one man are this number, one in 10 to the 17. Here's the way to understand that. It'd be like the odds in this. No, this is what Peter Stone and I want you to get, to, I want to get this right. Peter Stone and, uh, Paul, uh, Peter Stone and Robert Newman, they say it this way. Here's what that number means. It would be like taking, not yet, not that, not yet. It would be like taking, not yet, take it off screen, thank you. It would be like taking the entire state of Texas and filling it two feet deep of quarters. How many know Texas is a big state? Come on, you should say amen to that one, right? Texas is a big state. I remember when I moved here from California, from Pennsylvania, I remember driving over Lake Charles, right? And then you come into the state and it says El Paso, 18 million miles away, right? It's just trying to prove to you everything's bigger in Texas, right? Two feet deep, the entire state of Texas, you would fill with quarters. Paint one quarter red, put it in the state somewhere, mix it all up, take one man, blindfold him, walk him into that state, say, walk until you feel led. And when you're ready, you bend down, you start digging into those quarters, and you pull out one quarter. The odds of eight prophecies that are beyond Jesus' control coming true in his life are the same odds that that man would pick the red quarter. And what I want you to know today is God has gone to great lengths to help you understand that he wants to be known, and he wants to be known by you, and he wants to know you. He's done it through Jesus and the resurrection, and he's done it through his word. He's done it through the New Testament. He's done it through the Old Testament. There are many ways that God is trying to communicate to you that I am real, this is true, and if you want faith, I've made myself known. And for me, what I want you to hear tonight is that the resurrection is a miracle. Amen? It's a miracle that changed everything. The New Testament Gospels in the, the letters, it's a miracle, amen? Amen? I want you to know the Old Testament, don't abandon it. Anchor it. Anchor it in the event of Jesus Christ. It is a miracle in and of its own self. Check out what Peter Stone says, talking about his science of prophetic probability. He says this, this means that the fulfillment of those eight prophecies alone proves that God inspired the writing of those prophecies to a definiteness, definiteness, which lacks only one in 10 to the 17th of being absolute. That's a big way of saying God has gone to great lengths to prove to you that this is the word of God. So don't let it get dusty. Start reading it, start, start growing. Here's, here's what I want to encourage you. This is my advice to you as your pastor, as a, a next gen pastor, focusing on the next gen. Anybody wanna hear a story of, you know, listen, listen, in 2003, let me tell you this, in 2003, I experienced one of the most vivid miracles of my life. I'm telling you, the natural laws got broken. 
It was supernatural. God literally moved on my behalf. And I'm telling you, I experienced God in a way that I'll never forget. It was, the, it was one of the top moments of my life. It was a miracle that had actually happened to me. Would any of you like to hear that story? 2003, a real moment in my history. Well, in 2003, this happened, but in the beginning, 1984, Jimmy was born. And I was born to Rick and Sherry Banks in 1984. But really, the story didn't start there. In 1978, my parents uh, were invited to go to a, a crusade, which was a big church service. And so let's go to 1978. It's going to take me about an hour to do each year leading up to 2003, okay? So I'm going to do an hour. We'll be here till 5 a.m. tomorrow. Some of you are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said I want to hear the story about 2003. Why are you going the whole way back? Here's all I'm trying to say is that the story of the Bible starts with the resurrection, starts with the event, starts with the moment. And the Old Testament is valuable, but it's all of the context that points towards a Savior. It points towards Jesus. For you to get the most out of the Old Testament, you've got to understand Jesus. That's why I put a book of John in your hand, that that is the place to start. I believe that the beginning of your, uh, your uh, reading of the Bible should start with John and Mark and Luke and Matthew, and then read the book of Acts, and then read the New Testament. Get a handle of who Jesus is, and then you can start jumping into the Old Testament and say, all right, let me see all of these prophecies. Let me see the context context of how God has been at work and how in the beginning, I read in John, in the beginning was the word and word was with God. And then in Genesis, I read in the beginning, God, how these things are working together and how there's a, a, a prophecy, even in Adam, where he says he will stomp on the head. He's talking about a Messiah and it's this beautiful thing. I want you to anchor your faith in the resurrection. And when you point people to Jesus, resurrection means dead things come to life. And then Jesus will point them to the Old Testament. Amen?